Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where customarily we go through the Bible in a live Bible study, chapter by chapter, currently in the book of Ecclesiastes, which will resolve, resume live this coming Monday, December 12th. However, today and tomorrow, we're presenting a two-part message in a tandem teaching done by Apostle Don Madison and myself on pressing into the pressure, breaking out into the kingdom. I know it will be a benefit to you. Here is part one, and then tomorrow we'll present the conclusion, part two of this powerful message. You know, one of the things uh, in the leading of the Spirit, leading of God, how uh, we begin sometimes because things get rough or they're different than what we have planned we stop and say well I must have made a mistake but uh, some, of the, some of the things that God has showed me and has shown me in, in life and in my own uh, testimony on how God uses you whether you understand it or not <laughs> and and whether you had plans, you walk in the plans, and then they're different than what you walked in. But you have never, you would have never gotten there unless you followed a plan and started to walk. Yeah. We're talking about steps, and uh, some of the scripture I was, you know, I was getting this download, so to speak, on. How God operates and moves. Sometimes it's, it's you know, uh, I, I, sometimes I hear preachers say, "Does that make sense?" How many ever heard that? Yeah. Well, sometimes it doesn't make sense, not no. to the natural person. Sometimes God moves in things that don't make sense to the natural mind, but they make sense to Him. And uh, now I'll show you what I'm talking about. Uh, in Proverbs 16, 9, the Bible says, A man's heart plans his way, mm -hmm. but the Lord directs his steps. Mm -hmm. It's not against making plans, but be very flexible in the plans that you make because they may have different characteristics and may different situations than you ever knew. Uh, taking you back a little ways, uh, back in 19, in the, in the, late 60s, uh, or in the mid 60s, uh, we read, my wife and I read The Cross and Switchblade. And uh, we, God really touched our lives through reading that book. And God gave uh, us a burden for the drug addicts. We, came, we were in California at the time. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I began to, I went to, I was working in LA at the time. And I went to uh, the Teen Challenge Center there. It was just uh, just there a year. And it's about the second or maybe third in the nation. And I met uh, Don Hall, which was the uh, director there, and and uh, had a good fellowship with him. And I was into air conditioning at the time, and I uh, he had a need there in his home, and I went over there and, and fixed his his uh, heater for him, and, and uh, we just became friends. But, and, you know, I had a vision. I was living in Chino at the time, and uh, we had a vision of having a center and, and moving with uh, in Team Challenge. And so God opened that door. And uh, but way, when I went about the way I went about it, it was just you know every every place I'd go past, I'd say you know that'd make a good building for a center. That'd be great. Uh, you know we could put so many people in there and so forth and so on. And then I began to go into their meetings and learn uh, because I never you know I was into alcohol, but I was never into the heroin and drugs. And they had major heroin users, guys that came out of prison out of San Quentin and so forth and so on. I wound up leading a man by the name of Larry Reed, and Larry Reed was a, just had gotten out of San Quentin. He was still in his whites, and 
he was having trouble because it, it, to him, Team Challenge was just another place for him to had been through Synanon and had been through NA, AA, and all of the all of the A's, and uh, didn't get any work, you know. And he'd been around the horn as far as uh, prison is concerned, and yet he was in the same. And Team Challenge was his last bastion, and so I. I had a chance to lead him to Jesus, first of all. He came up to the dormitory, and I had a chance to bring him to the Lord. Later on, he became, we found a place in, in the Cucamonga. Cucamonga, we had uh, a, a uh, found an old five-bedroom home, and we moved in there with our kids. We had three girls and then began to work with the addicts and, and have meetings in Ontario uh, you know, um, auditorium meetings and so forth and so on, and bring addicts from from L.A. in there. And, and I just begin to move like this, not knowing, I mean, we're talking about just a very short period of time. And, uh, but I had, as a young man, and, and you know, I was saved in 1958, and, and I had, you know, I had been in ministry and, uh, you know, leading choirs and do, doing different things, but I'd never been involved with this kind of an operation. And so, uh, but I saw, Burton, I, I figured this, if a person could be addicted to drugs or addictions to anything, if they could be addicted to God to the same extent that they were addicted to, to, uh, to heroin and have the need uh, of, of the of the fix every four hours. You're talking about something that is, uh, and, and is willing to sell his mother-in-law for it. I mean, you know, there's, you know, it, it's that, and wait for hours on the street corner, waiting for your connection, and all of this, the person had that addiction to Christ. And so I recognize that addiction is something that God put into a man or a woman for a purpose, for to be addicted to him. And so, but I, I went through these things, and I can I can speak about oh, a number of ministries that we began over the years. But knowing, uh, having some kind of a program, having some kind of a one, two, three, four, it it, it never worked for me, no. because God led me into uh, to people, places, and things that He had in mind. He was directing my steps. My my plans, I mean, I wrote out all my plans. I took them to the pastors. I took them there. I took them there and showed them the vision and so forth and so on. But I was very flexible knowing this, that God would probably use uh, in some of them, but many of them he wouldn't even use. But I was still walking. I was still stepping. If you've ever come to a place where you you got to a place where you've tried this and tried this and you and you kept going, you will come to that place of your inheritance if you keep going. Uh, a man's steps are ordered by the Lord. How then can a man un understand his own way? If God is, is directing your steps, how can you understand your own way? Well, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he'll what? Direct your path. So the direction of God, when we acknowledge Him, and we we don't lean upon our own understanding, He will lead us, because He's more, uh, He's more, uh, let's say, He's more interested in in getting us to move into who He has chosen us to be than we are to get there, because it was the blood of His Son that purchased our lives, and so that's important to the Father. And uh, there's an, uh, a man that, uh, uh, that God used. I mean, he's the example in the beginning of what we call faith. And that's uh, Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of, uh, out of a certain place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. God says your 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 children are going to be like here. The guy's uh, 
at that point probably about 75 years old. Your children are going to be uh, like the stars of the sky and the sand and the sea. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and by the time that actually the promise came to, to bear, Sarah was 90 and he was 100. And she was supposed to have a baby. You see, and so that boggles the mind, you know, and I know you ladies, it boggles yours too. No, no, not, not anymore. I want twins. Oh, okay, all right. But, but, but the Bible says Abraham was as good as dead. In other words, he didn't. He didn't have any goods. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and sometimes God will uh, ask you to do something that doesn't make human sense. Like this. After he had given the promise to Isaac, God said, I want you to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. In this mouth. Now Abraham, and it says that Abraham, Abraham did not stagger, because he was more in touch with the promise than he was in this particular thing, and he knows that God is not double-minded. That's why he said to the boy, he said, Isaac says, "Hey, I see the wood, and I see this that you're carrying, but where's the sacrifice?" And he said, God will provide him a sacrifice. He didn't say, you're going to be the sacrifice. No. He said, God will provide himself, himself, uh -huh. himself, him. sacrifice. Looking back to Jesus. Amen. See? And so he took, uh, he went up and he just about ready to plunge the knife into his yeah. son, his yeah. only son, that was the promise that would bear all these children uh -huh. to him and make it, you know, and, and, do all the promises, but he was ready to do it, and he, and believing that God was raising from the dead. And That's all right. And God, and the angel said, "No, you don't have to go." Mm -hmm. But the testing of a, of your faith and your word mm -hmm. comes to bear whenever you're ready to move into a strategic part of your life. A strategic part, because the promise is everything to God. Because of the price paid for it. Amen. The blood was shed for the promises that he has given to you. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you. The promise. I don't care how old you are, how young you are. He's given you a promise and that is the most, that's yeah. the greatest thing. Because it was the, the promises of God that was purchased by Jesus with his blood. And so it's, it's, it's very... Uh, and that's what he's looking for us to do, is to have a heart of the promise. That's why it's called the promised land. Mm -hmm. The promised land. The inheritance. That's our inheritance. And we must, under, we must embrace the heart that looks for the inheritance, because the inheritance was purchased by the blood too. And God has given to all of us an inheritance. And promises that supersede. Anything that we could ask or think. Eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has supplied for them that love him. Amen. It hasn't even moved into your consciousness upon the prize that is waiting. And God has it for everyone. No one is left out. But, the, but he wants you to, to, to lay hold he wants us to lay hold. It doesn't make sense for him to say, I want you to go sacrifice your son to the natural mind. Mm -hmm. but, but Abraham was not fastened in his natural thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, he did some stuff, like uh, well, told his wife to say that you're, you're, you're my sister, mm -hmm. so that the king wouldn't you know, take him for himself. So I mean, uh, and and you know that was a little bit, a uh, little movement there, but the point is, is that we, uh, we are heirs of promise. We are heirs of of what God has promised us, and this word, and what. Uh, let's turn to First Corinthians two twenty six, and then I'm through. I think.
this is this is our our place in the picture here and we don't like to think of it this way we like to think that we are all uh, oh um, you know there's a certain uh, wisdoms about us and 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 we, you know we have certain uh, and I'm not saying a, 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 you know anybody in here but a lot of times we will have uh, ideas about ourselves that uh, when he talks about people that he uses, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.26 through 31, it says, um, let's see, what is it? Second, uh, no, 1 Corinthians 2, 26 to 31. Second, 1 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry. Okay, here it is. It's uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 26. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I made mistakes as well. It says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. What we would call foolishness or foolish operation. The whole thing that he demonstrated to, uh, in, in uh, Isaac's case, would seem foolish to the world. But it wasn't foolish to God. Because God had initiated it in the first place. To the natural mind, it was foolishness. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the thing to. Shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world to sh uh, the things that are dis despise uh, things that are despised. God has chosen, and things that are which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom of, from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. <coughs> Take it to the bank. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That, I, I, when, I, when it talks about that, you know, I put myself in a, <laughs> a position. <laughs> the cheapest. <laughs> so when things get rough, did you make a mistake? The Apostle Paul in his first missionary journey was really interesting. He, he was where he was let down in a basket, where they started a riot, where 39 uh, Jews swore an oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul. And every place he went, he, he won converts. And then upheaval would begin, and he would flee to the next city, and he was beaten, and he went through all these things. And the thing that interested me about it is there are the times that he had the opportunity to do so. He'd gather with the believers after the trouble started, and he'd basically say, sorry for your luck, and uh, we'll see you when we see you. And... You know, the way most people conceive of apostolic ministry, you figured, well, where's the infrastructure? Why didn't we ordain elders? 
how come he didn't uh, connect them with uh, back with the church at Antioch, which was the church that sent him out? He didn't do any of those things. And then he went about a year to two years out, and then he stopped on his second missionary journey and went back to every one of those churches and did two things. It said he confirmed the souls of the saints, which, and if you study that word confirm, it meant he laid hands on them and he prophesied over them. Now, what did he prophesy over them? Placement. He, he prophesied placement in, to, into their midst. He ordained elders. He spoke to their calling. But then he said he exhorted them. And I believe what he did is he corrected his doctrine. That it is through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. Now, some people read that on the surface in theology. We'll take that verse. And when someone is suffering, uh, when, they're, when they're suffering something that is a contradiction to God's promise, they will say, well, it's through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. As though, like, you got to get sick to die. Yeah. It's through, you got to get sick to go to heaven, so much tribulation you enter. That's the way they read that. That is not what that word means. You look at that word tribulation, it means manifold pressure. Manifold pressure. And the kingdom it's talking about is not talking about going to heaven when you die. It doesn't exclude that. But what is the kingdom? Romans 14 says the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. Those are three very specific things. What is uh, joy and peace? It's like that, that little GPS device you got in your car. It has to have two coordinates. It has to draw two coordinates in order to place you on a, on a grid and tell you where you're going. Isaiah 55, 14, is it? says that you'll go out with joy and you'll be led forth with peace. And so it's all about Guidance, the peace of God. Let the peace of God, the Amplified says in Colossians, uh, act as an umpire in your heart. I love in the book of uh, Acts chapter 15, they were having to decide about the Gentile question. And they got together and had much disputation. And if they had been evangelicals, they would have rolled out the theology, they would have inquired into uh, the, the prophets and the scriptures and all of that, and they were certainly doing that. But then Peter got up and he said something, and they, these these people were coming to blows in Acts 15. It was just a good old fashioned church fight, is what it was. And Peter got up and says, "Look here, fellas, you don't understand. I was up on the roof taking a nap, and I had a dream." And a, God came to me in a vision, and he said this to me, and that settled the whole matter. Now, you try doing that in a traditional church setting today, and they're all going to roll their eyes, say, yeah, right, here he goes again, another vision, another, that doesn't establish anything. But Peter said, I've had a vision. And they said, that settles it, because they said it seems a good to God, to us, and to the Holy Ghost. Well, how did they know it seemed good to the Holy Ghost? Because it gave them peace. It didn't make any sense. You have to understand, when they talked about Gentiles and referred to them as dogs that are without, mm -hmm. we use that as a, as a metaphor of denigration. Dogs. That wasn't how they saw it. They were the chosen people. And to them, Gentiles were like a subspecies. They were the human beings. They were God's, God's men and God's women, the holy nation. And they did not see themselves as men like other men. And so for Peter to get all excited and say, look here, Cornelius and his whole house, they've received the Holy Ghost like we did at the first. That would be like me and Kitty bringing in Deacon and Scarlet, our little Marquis and our golden retriever, and they're sitting right there, 
And we're so excited. We're here to tell you that Deacon and Scarlet, that's a Holy Ghost. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's that was that was that was that was that you enter the kingdom and it says the kingdom is righteousness first. What is righteousness? The word there means to stand up right. So positionally, it's the ability to stand up right before God, to come boldly by the throne of grace through a new and living way that he has consecrated. And that word come boldly means brazenly. I mean, come so boldly that you offend every religious person in here. Oh, yeah. To come boldly by a new and living way now into the holiest, the holiest place where a Jew would drop dead if something wasn't quite right, if his sash was not tied on quite right, if there was something not, some protocol not followed. And the interesting thing is, we know, we, look, we've read Thomas Akempis, Madame Guion, uh, Jacob Bohm. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe the more esoteric among us may have read Jane Lead. Uh, and so we, we know that mysticism, there is a Christian mis mysticism oh, yeah. that does pay dividends into yeah, the life of the mystic and into the life of those of us who choose to study the mystic. Mm -hmm. And we understand that it takes consecration to walk with God at that level. Mm -hmm. But the verse there in Hebrews, as I say, we, it's what it says is we come boldly by a new and living way that he has consecrated. That's right. right. It's his consecration all about producing it. in us access mm -hmm. into the holiest. Yes, right. Now, again, that's positional. We teach right, righteousness. It's positional. It's also who he is to us. It's not moral excellence. It's because 1 Corinthians one thirty said God made Jesus to be our wisdom, sanctification, and our righteousness. Your righteousness is a person. His name is Jesus. Right. Now, what does that look like on an everyday basis? When it's talking about entering the kingdom. So, the kingdom is, now look at the order. Righteousness, peace, and joy. So, the first thing we encounter is righteousness. Because we can stand upright before him. What does that mean? On an everyday basis basis, that means everything you say and do becomes as effective as if you said it or did. Are you sure I Why? Oh, who do you think you are? No, it's not who I think I am. It's his consecration paying its dividends into my life. And I'm just having the audacity to believe it. Mm -hmm. That it's not yeah. that he acts in my behalf. That's in right. me, to me, in me, and through me. Not on the basis of who I am or what I have done, but on the basis right. of who he is and what he has done. But getting back to Acts 14.22, it is through much tribulation you enter the kingdom. Pressure. pressure. Manifold pressure. Different mm -hmm. kinds of pressure. Pressure from people. Pressure from circumstances. Mm -hmm. Pressure from uh, all kinds of things that come at you. And what are you going to do? Normally, when we're under pressure, we get this thing going that says, that's not convenient for me. <laughs> yeah. And we allow the pressure to push us. And so the more intense the pressure, the more prone we are to deviate to the right hand or to the left. That's what the children of Israel did when they should have crossed the Jordan. They should have spent 40 days mm -hmm. at Sinai. Uh, and they say it's a 10-day trip. So to say 40, 50 days altogether, they should have been penetrating Canaan and taking down Jericho. But what happened? They got a report of pressure. And it was interesting. They had really good preachers that came out. They said, yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And I have been there. But there's giants in that land. Oh, well, we can't go. Moses rebuked him in Deuteronomy. He said, God wanted us to go in. But you said we would have men go before us. But the men came back, aggrandizing themselves. And boasting about where they had been mm -hmm. and convincing the people that they didn't have what it took. Mm -hmm. Except for Caleb mm -hmm. and Joshua. And, Joshua. and so the whole point that when you are 
If you want to enter the kingdom, if you want to step, if you press into the pressure, you will break out into the place where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if God said it or did it. And suddenly, guidance is intuitive. Guidance is second nature then. The peace of God and the joy of God makes you want to charge hell with a water pistol. <laughs> the peace of God, I mean, nobody's happy with you, everybody's upset with you, and thought they knew who you were, what you were, and suddenly you are moving at angles spiritually that don't make any sense. <coughs> You're walking through the walls that everyone else has been relying on as a justification for why they can't step out in the kingdom. And they're looking into that place that they dare not go, and they see you looking back at them. And they are absolutely convinced that they're more spiritual than you are, so they have to find something wrong with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> see, pressing into the pressure means... <coughs> That when you're under pressure, you're taking a direction, and pressure comes, you stay linear in your thinking. You stay linear in your decision making. I, I will not take into consideration what the circumstance says, what people say. I know what God has told me, and I'm going to keep pressing into that. I will not look, like the scripture says, to the right hand or to the left. And if I look back, I'm it for what I've been pressing into. That's right. Jesus said, if you're not, if you don't deny yourself, you're not fit for my kingdom. Mm -hmm. He wasn't being petulant. He was saying it might like this. I know what it takes to follow my father. Mm -hmm. And if you're not investing your sense of self-referral in who he is, mm -hmm. you're not going to make it through the pressure zone mm -hmm. that you have to penetrate in order to break out into that place. Right. 